Hey everybody, I'm Various Artists. I am the host of the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast and blog, and I'm making a video for you today. This is on the what would have been David Bowie's 75th birthday, January 8th, 2022. He was born in 1947. And for this 75th, I'm doing this video where I've selected 14 of my more, more interesting David Bowie pieces of vinyl. I'm going to show them to you, talk about them. For those of you who don't know the MyLifeInConcert.com podcast, and it started as a blog in 2010, now it's a podcast, and I'm looking at every, pretty much almost every concert I've seen from 1975 to the present. And there's a few Bowie gigs in there that I've talked about or will be talking about, and I'll mention that more at the end of the video. So let's get on with the vinyl. All right, let's start with number one, and it's this, um, I'm going to present them in the order of when they were, when the recordings are from. And I'll start with this kind of really cool 10-inch EP that I bought in the early 80s when it was released. And this EP comprises the first two singles that Bowie released as, sorry, the second and third singles Bowie released as a recording artist. His first was Li Liza Jane. Uh, with the King Bees in 1964. And this four-track EP on this nifty 10-inch size uh, features his uh, one and only single with the Manish Boys and one of two singles he did with the lower third. This is the first one, but at this point he is still, I don't know if you can see that, Davy Jones and the lower third. Uh, and this Now this EP is interesting and the tracks on it are interesting because there's uh, the, the Manish Boys, on the A side, they do I Pity the Fool, which is the Bobby Blue Bland track from the early 60s, and a lot of people have covered it. Now, what's interesting with this track, of course, the Manish Boys were sort of a bluesy band playing in and around London, but this track, uh, there's a guitar solo in the middle, and there's always been a bit of a debate of who's playing it, but to my ears, it sounds like Jimmy Page to me. And that's, that's never been 100% confirmed, but it sounds like Page. And the B-side, uh, Take My Tip, that's significant. It's written by Davy Jones. So this is the first recording ever released that he wrote, this B-side. And the second single with this uh, new band he started, The Lower Third, which he was in in 65 and 66, they were more in sort of a Who Yardbird sort of vein. And this single of uh, You've Got a Habit of Leaving and Baby Loves That Way, it was the first uh, single Bowie wrote the A side and the B side, both as Davy Jones. I find these early recordings really interesting. Um, they've got a great spirit to them. Not the best stuff he did, um, but it's, it's not crap either. I, I think they're fun to listen to. I really enjoy this. And this is a great little EP. Number two is this EP, self-titled EP, released in the early 80s, but comprising the A and B sides of the three singles he released for Pi Records in 1966. And if my understanding is correct, this is a Canada-only EP, and I don't know how many were pressed, so I think it's fairly rare. Now, the materials on this have been released many times, the six tracks from 1966. Uh, but again, the EP, the, the tracks on there are significant because... Uh, can't Help Thinking About Me, which is now on the newly released toy, did a, a more modern version of it. But that's one of his best early songs, and it was his first record released as David Bowie, David Bowie and the Lower Third. And the other tracks were his first singles uh, as a solo artist. So, an interesting Canada-only EP, terrible cover, but uh, I really enjoy, I was When I was going back and trying to get all this early stuff in the early 80s, it was great that this EP was out. Now, the tracks on this album were also released on this very cool little box set that uh, Cublet got for me many Christmases ago, uh, the Pi Singles. Inside, you get the three singles as miniatures, all with their own sleeves and that sort of thing. So, cool little set. Number three, Images 1966-67. to 67. Now, this was a compilation that was released in the early 70s after Ziggy Stardust had hit. And it's a compilation of all the stuff he did for Darum Records at the end of 66, but mostly through 67. And what it really is, is an expanded version of his very first uh, album, his debut album, which is rather odd. It's a very strange album. He's very into Anthony Newley at this time in that kind of sort of British theater uh, sort of sound. The best thing about this album, though, is the cover by Neon Park, who did so many great Little Feet album covers. It's another artist I'm a fan of. 
Um, but for me, it's uh, I just love all these little each sort of each song has its own little window and cartoon graphic. So it's a really killer cover. Uh, but I remember I used to love just pouring over that and looking at this in the early 70s. So that's number three. Number four, the Spying Through a Keyhole singles box set. Now, this is fairly newly released. It just came out a couple of years ago. It's a very interesting box set of nine demos that he recorded in 1968. Now, 68's kind of an interesting year because he didn't release anything during the year, but was writing a lot of songs. And I feel, especially going back and hearing this box set, um, that the, the tunes, you can see that his writing took a big, big jump. And of course, his next full album, Space Oddity, reflected that. But this is from a very folky period in his career that really wasn't documented. And many of the songs, the recordings are sometimes a bit rough, but they're great demos. And there's a number of songs that he would go on to do or refurbish. But there's also a lot of great tunes on here he never properly recorded in any official form. So it's great that we have this and all the singles inside are housed as if they're acetates, as if they're sort of generically pressed up acetates for someone to use to pass around. So it's really neat how it's packaged as well. Number five is a bootleg I bought many years ago called the Beckenham Oddity, recorded in 1969, early 1969, with John Hutchinson. Now, this was his demo tape that he sent to Mercury Records that ultimately got him signed. And it's a white label on the inside and features a number of tunes that would show up on Space Oddity uh, singles in early 1970 and some tracks he didn't record elsewhere. It's him and Hutchinson with acoustic guitars. These tapes among collectors and bootleggers were very, very well known and released in a number of forms. Unfortunately for me, the B side of the album was pressed off center, so there was always that sound when I played it. Luckily, the entirety of the Beckenham Oddity tapes, as well as all the singles on Spying Through a Keyhole, were eventually released just a couple of years ago on this fantastic box set conversation piece. Number a bootleg I bought many years ago of his 1970 single, The Prettiest Star with Conversation Piece, which was the title of the box set, um, on the B-side. And also it's got Holy Holy, which was his early 1971 single. And they're using the original, uh, I think the original art, but put through a color filter from the single. And I've got this picture on the back, uh, David Bowie. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, it's put out by, uh, it's a bootleg on, it's meant to look like Mercury, the Mercury Records label, and uh, but it's actually Major Tom Records. And you've got the two tracks on the B side. And of course it plays at 33 RPM. Uh, so it's not the regular uh, single speed. Now conversation piece um, was just on the one single, but uh, also interesting is The Prettiest Star, which was a single from early 1970. It has Mark Bolan playing lead guitar on it. And a few years later, Bowie re-recorded the tune for Aladdin Sane. And basically, um, Mick Ronson just took Bolan's guitar solo and largely replicated it. And uh, uh, I it's interesting that Bolan plays on the original. I actually think the version on here is, is better. And Holy Holy, the uh, track from early 71, I think that's my least favorite Bowie single from the 69 to 80 period. He re-recorded that a couple of years later with the Spiders from Mars, and it's a much better version. Number seven is another semi-legal release from the early 80s, and it's with this uh, band that he had together very briefly called Arnold Corns. Uh, in the 71 era, and it really it was a, a predecessor to the whole Ziggy Stardust thing, the androgyny, and clothes designer Freddie Beretti was part of the group, and um, this is a three-track single featuring Man in the Middle, a tune Bowie didn't record anywhere else, and actually it's Beretti on lead vocals with Bowie doing the backing vocals. And on the B-side, there's two tracks. First, there's Looking for a Friend, uh, which Bowie did release a, a live version of on Bowie at the Beeb. And the other track on side two is Hang On To Yourself, this early version recorded with Arnold Corns, And of course, he cut the definitive version of the track a few months later on the rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Number eight, we have this 12-inch single for 
the Little Drummer Boy piece on Earth with Bowie and Bing Crosby. Now, Bowie appeared on Bing Crosby's final Christmas special, and it was recorded uh, in the fall, early fall, late summer of 1977, um, when they appeared together doing this duet, and also Bowie's in it. Um, they're showing the video of Heroes in the eventual Christmas special. Now, I first heard of this happening when I was in the UK in 1977, and picked up the latest version of Melody Maker while, while I was there, one of several I bought in a few weeks. And it's got this article on the cover, Bowie Plans Tour. And it says in the article, Bowie has been working on a Bing Crosby Christmas TV special for ATV on which he duets with Bing on The Little Drummer Boy. Um, and the show Bing Crosby's Merry Old Christmas has Bowie guesting with Twiggy, Stanley Baxter, Ron Moody, and the Trinity Boys Choir set in a country home. Filming is now completed. I remember reading that and going, wow, that's strange, and telling a, a Bowie friend of mine that was happening and he refused to believe it until it actually came on air. And of course, the other big news here, Townsend blasts the Stranglers. Well, I like the Who and the Stranglers, so I'll sort of leave that alone. And there's the Stranglers, No More Heroes. Anyway, back to Bowie. So this was released as a single a few years later against his wishes. It was a big Christmas hit. It's now a perennial Christmas song. But this is a very interesting record as it's a 12-inch it's a single. Um, I'm trying to think if... I think this is... I think it plays at 45, but as you will see, it's that rare recording where you get a lot of label. It's a big label recording. I don't have many. I have 7-inch singles, 12-inch singles, 10-inch singles, but not too many with massive labels. So that's, that's a really wonderful thing, this big picture of Bowie and Bing. Number nine is this untitled picture disc. Um, with these pictures of him sort of around the Let's Dance era, and I bought it in the early 80s. There's one, and there's another. Hi there. And uh, this actually, though, is from when he had released Lodger, and it's a uh, an interview with a U.S. radio station DJ going through his career. He's selecting songs, and this picture disc... Um, They've cut out all the music, but you've just got the interview. So kind of an interesting sort of curio from the time. The pictures don't match uh, really the period, but it's kind of an interesting interview. For me, the highlight is when the DJ asks him, asks him what he is listening to these days, and one of the bands he lists is Throbbing Gristle, and you hear the DJ go, Throbbing Gristle? So number... What number is this? Oh, Thanks. Number 10. Number 10, The Ball EP, uh, released in 82. Now, this was uh, Bowie acted in a BBC production. I believe it was BBC, it was one, of the, one of the British channels. Um, and they, uh, he acted in this version of a more obscure Bertolt Brecht play called Ball. And this is a very interesting EP, a five-track EP. Um, that you, uh, Two tracks on side one, three on side two. And this is Bowie doing tracks from the Ball um, production. And um, now he had recorded Bertolt Brecht songs before, but this is him performing them very much in the style of which they were first written in the 20s. So um, very interesting curio. And it's really the only recording Bowie ever did in this vein, this type of music. So not something that I put on all the time, but very, very interesting to have and um, sort of interesting in his catalog. And also that five track EP um, on the seven inches and is, uh, is interesting as well. It was also his final recording for RCA. And I know that uh, he wanted to get off the label. They, they've been in a lot of disagreements. So um, when he handed this in as his last recording, they were probably a little miffed because it's uh, not exactly very commercial, but interesting that he did it anyway. Number 11, Bowie Rare. Uh, I think this was a bit of a retaliation by RCA. Now, he'd left the label, had signed with uh, EMI America, and uh, Let's Dance was due to come out just a few months after this. So this was released, I believe, right at the end of 82. He did not want it coming out. And um, it's sort of an odd, just odds and ends, B-sides, outtakes, live tracks. It's not an incredible album, but I know I was really happy when it came out because it had all these interesting tracks that I didn't have access to. This is 
before there was all these CD reissues where they would put all these um, tracks on extra CD. So anyway, it was uh, not the greatest compilation, but a very interesting one. And um, pretty much it was out, disappeared, and it's never been issued on CD. And so sort of a unique one to have with some interesting material on it. Number 12. So for number 12, we jump from the 80s into a more contemporary era as the last three pieces of vinyl are from the 2010s. This is his 2014 single, Sue or in a Season of Crime. And I managed to get this limited edition 10-inch single version. And it's made to look like a classic Parlophone 10-inch um, single, say from the 30s. Back in the day, before there were distinctive record covers, most singles were released in just a plain paper um, envelope, which is what we have here. As you can see, it, it's paper and on the back, it has some of the lyrics. Uh, this was released for Record Store Day in 2014 and I had read about it and uh, went online and somehow managed, they were as a few they were selling on Amazon within the day after I put in the order, they were sold out and I got it a few weeks later, but a very interesting, again, my second 10 inch Bowie, an interesting release with also the original version of uh, Tis a Pity, She Was a Whore. Both of these songs he re-recorded on Black Star in totally different versions. And also too, when this came out, it was far more experimental than what I was expecting from the single. I actually love this 45 and it sort of let listeners know of the direction he was gonna be taking with Black Star on his next album because it's moving in that vein. So an interesting limited edition 10 inch version of this single. 13 is the vinyl edition of Black Star, his excellent and final LP. And the packaging on this one is just incredible. You have this beautiful die cut star with the black vinyl album uh, behind it. And uh, of course on the one, uh, so this is side two, it's blank. So you have a completely black star on the outside with some of the track material on the other side of the album. The plastic case itself is a very, very hard shell plastic. So it's really nicely made. The cover of the vinyl also picks up from uh, on the, you know, what they did with the CD where it's black on black. You have this sort of glossy black print on sort of a darker black cover. So basically to be able to see or read everything, see or read anything, you have to sort of hold it up to the lights, which I thought was a, quite a metaphor for the album. And there's also a beautiful booklet on the inside. Again, the black on the black photos. So it's a beautifully packaged vinyl release that uh, I understand that Bowie oversaw and was particularly happy um, with um, how this was packaged. Now the actual vinyl album too is etched uh, in a way, it's kind of hard to see, but if you play it and you have the right light on it, you'll actually see like a bird moving on the vinyl. I've seen uh, videos online of people doing it. I tried it. We tried it a few times. We couldn't make it work, but interesting concept. And finally, number 14 is the No Plan EP from 2017, released the year after his death. It collects some outtakes from uh, Black Star, uh, songs that were used in the Lazarus play, but Bowie recording them himself in this four track EP uh, that also features Lazarus. Uh, from Black Star as the lead track, but three tracks that aren't on the album, particularly uh, What I Met You. I kind of wish that had been on the album. Now, the vinyl is interesting because all of the tracks are on one side of the record rather than being split over the two sides. On the other side, there's no music. It's just an etched side of vinyl. And if, I don't know if this is coming through, you can see the star and sort of Bowie's name at the bottom done in the star sort of font created for the Black Star album. So sort of an interesting visual on the one side with the music on the other. So that wraps up my look at the 14 interesting pieces of Bowie vinyl. Um, now, mylifeinconcert.com, the podcast and the series, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's me going through my life as a very avid concert goer from 1975 right through to the present and uh, reliving and talking about gigs that I've been to and sort of what was going on in my life, also having some friends come by. Now, I saw Bowie five times and the last time I saw him, I've already done a podcast uh, for that. And that was episode five, concert number 104, Never Get Old. And it's from the time I saw him, April 2nd, 
uh, 2004, just a few months before his unfortunate heart attack. One of the best shows I ever saw him play. So there's a, a small entry about that on the website and the podcast. Also, I've got a web entry, a, a blog entry for the first time I saw him uh, at CNE in Toronto in uh, September of 1983. And that entry is called Let's Dance. And I'll be doing a podcast about that concert uh, at CNE Stadium in Toronto with Rough Trade in just a few months. So stay tuned for that. Just to let you know, in terms of the podcast, there's three episodes I'm working on that are coming up very shortly. Episode number 16 is going to be happening, and it's actually on a very recent concert. When I started the series, I wanted to look at a show from every decade, but couldn't do one this decade because COVID hit. So this was my first show of the decade, and it's an amazing show from a few weeks ago. Uh, Caribou coming here to London, Ontario to the Music Hall. It's going to be episode number 16 and so that's coming up. Also, uh, February 7th is the anniversary of the podcast, mylifeinconcert.com podcast, the second anniversary. So I'm doing two anniversary episodes this year where I kind of go out of my sort of the schedule I'm following and uh, look at a significant gig. So I've got one coming up in February, looking back on seeing Keith Richards and the expensive winos in Detroit at the Fox Theater in 1988, a really incredible gig with a particular experience that happened and you'll have to tune in and listen to that. And my series will continue uh, with the show episode number 17, sorry, episode number 18, And it's the English Beat, as they were called over here, or the Beat in England, with REM here in London, Ontario, April 1983. So stick around for that. My pal special guests, a.k.a. Phil Robinson, uh, comes back uh, once again. And this episode in particular, he has a lot of great stories, so stick around. Anyway, once again, thanks for tuning in. Uh, You can see this on the YouTube channel, the mylifeinconcert.com site. We're also on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, So please check that out. Follow if you're interested and please tune into the podcast. And of course, I need to mention the reason I'm doing the video is happy birthday, David. I wish you were here, but thanks for all the great music. It's go- your music's going to live forever, and thanks so much for all that you gave. Um, let's all listen to his music on his birthday. And so this is me, your host, Various Artists, signing off once again. See you soon.